see children growing up in the church these days. Amen. All right. We had wonderful time of worship here together, so we're already off to a great start. I'm so grateful by the song selection. Uh, it rolls right in with the sermon today with our message. And, and so I'd like to ask that you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 in the New Testament. We're looking at verses uh, in this study, the essence of Christian leadership. Uh, we're looking at verses 1 through 14. But more specifically, today we were going to just be looking at the first couple of verses. And I'm going to be picking up where we left off last Sunday. And so I just want to do a brief recap over what we discussed. We were kind of talking about ministry. In case you didn't notice, ministry is a critical part of what we are doing in here today, obviously. Uh, but ministry is just not a calling for one person, but is a calling for every person in Christ. We all have a distinct gift that God has given us, a special gift, a special talent, and we are only given that gift, and we are only given that talent so that we could glorify Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why we have it. Uh, and, and, and so if you're sitting here today and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as, as your Savior, and you are one of His children, and He has called you, He has also called you to a special ministry. And there are different types of ministry. All ministry is not what I'm doing right here, right now. It's not being an oracle of God is what we've looked at in the scripture. But it is also, you know, you could be a, a prayer warrior. You could be somebody who is really serious about talking to the Lord, especially pertaining to those who are suffering in this church. We have a prayer list we publish every week. And there are people who need our prayers. They wouldn't be on this prayer list if they didn't need our prayers. And so what a critical role it is to have prayer warriors. I am grateful to know that before I climb into this pulpit, that there are those devoted, that they would ask that God would minister in and through me so that I could share something that would help you all to better your lives and, 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 to, and to understand more about these great mysteries of God that you might get closer to your God and you might know them better. But there are other ministries. Some of us are servers. Some of us are eager to come into this place and to, and to work and, and to do things that are needed to be done. Some of us are blessed with wonderful voices that we might lead worship and, and what a wonderful time we have in the Lord. I can't imagine ever climbing into this pulpit without having the opportunity to sing praises to God. It gets me so excited to get up here and to remember what the reason is that I'm in this place. And so that's why we have our music coming into this church. That's why we open our service that way is to prepare our hearts, to give God glory, to let them know we love them and also to remind us the importance of what it is that we're doing in here. And it's so important to understand that 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 this is not just a place where we get together and we, and we fellowship and we vi visit with one another, but it's a place where God fellowships and visits with us. <laughs> and, and it's easy to forget that, that God comes into this place and he ministers to us and he talks to us. And, and, and worship is to remind us of that fact, that we're in here to hear from God, not me, and not from our, our music leaders. But we're hoping that the Holy Spirit might touch us. And that when we leave, somehow our life is going to be better because we have a better understanding of God's calling on us. And we have a better understanding of, of what God wants us to do. Or we might even have a, an understanding of how to overcome a situation that seems like we just can't get through it. And so we come into this place to be encouraged by the ministry that happens in this building. There are many forms of it. But in this particular group of verses, the first four verses of chapter 5, we're kind of looking at the ministry that is of those who are oracles of God. Those who open the word of God and they share it with other people. This is serious business. If I'm going to come into this pulpit and I'm going to share with you the word of God, then I need to be studied. And I need to be right with the Lord. And I need to be faithful in those duties that he's called me to do it. Or else I could lead you astray. And I don't want to do that. I really do care about each and every one of you on a level that I just can't explain. I didn't even know y'all. Many of y'all didn't know before today. I'm just meeting some of you today. But some of y'all didn't even know months before now. And somehow I've had this burden placed in my heart to make sure that I don't do anything or say anything that would harm your way of life as you know it right now. So I come into this position very reverent to the, the authority that God has given me. Not because of... Uh, necessarily because of what I might do to you, but also because I'm reverent of the Lord. And I'm afraid that I might disappoint them. And I don't want to disappoint them. And so if you're called to ministry, this message is for you, especially if you're called to ministry 
uh, and, and being an oracle of God and sharing the word of God with other people. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 gives us a couple of verses of scripture pertaining to, mi to ministry. Verse 10 says, As each one of you has received a gift, meaning each child of God you have received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's put something in you that is special for this body, which we call the church, to work. And if you are not using that special talent that God gave you, you're suffering the good people around you. We need your participation in ministry. And it could be as simple as just being a prayer warrior. But there are many other functions in this body. Not every person in here is a hand that can reach. Not every person is a foot here that can walk. Not every person in here has got the same passions in the same directions, but we have all got one thing in common, and that is because we are in here because we love the Lord, we want to serve Him, we want to follow Him. And so he says, if you are going to be my children, then I commission you to the great work of ministry, to sharing Jesus Christ with the world, not just by your mouth, but by your attitude and your actions. We're called to servants. And that would be a good steward of the manifold grace of God. See, stewards are slaves to a master. That's what a steward is. They're responsible for somebody's uh, possessions. They're responsible for somebody's work. Used to, slavery didn't have such a bad connotation as it does now. Slavery throughout the centuries has been abused, not just in our country, but in countries abroad. But what Scripture is talking about is there used to be a profession of servants. There were people who were not bound to servitude because if they weren't, they were beaten. They were bound to it because it was their duty. And they actually enjoyed serving somebody else. Can you imagine the thought? And so that is the construct of the church. As a pastor, even the name pastor, it means servant. I am here to serve you good people. And I hope to serve you the bread of life today, to, to serve you the word of God, that we might break it together and better understand the passion that Jesus has for us and renew our passion for him. And so in verse 11, it says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him is the praise and the dominion forever and ever. And so I stand up here, not on my own initiative, or not on my own behalf, but I just hope to be a conduit. I just hope to be the mouthpiece of God that every word I tell you is what God wants you to hear. And so if you would, if you, if you really believe that, then I would ask you to just listen up. This is so critical. The church would not be here today. This church would not be here today if it weren't for the functions of ministry. And so we praise God for every able body, for every person who heard the call, who decided to step into the pulpit, into these classrooms, who decided to make sure that the fellowship was real through meals, and, and who prayed for the young preacher who climbed these stairs Sunday after Sunday, and to the person who prayed for that ill member to get over cancer. Those people are the reason why the church is still here. The world is in 100% opposition of this function right here. Every day writes that we deserve our God-given liberal rights are being taken away from us. Why do they want to shut the doors of this place so bad when we're only here to help each other, to love each other, and to glorify God? It's because the world is designed to break us down. So ministry is huge. They've been trying to shut the doors of the church for a long time, since Jesus and before. And so we need to take a special reverence when handling this portion of scripture because it's vital it's critical and it's valuable let's look at our scripture today verses one through four in the fifth chapter of peter the elders who are among you i exhort i who am a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed shepherd the flock of god which is among you serving as overseers not by constraint but willingly not for monetary gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Father, we just anticipate your message right now, God. We ask that you'd speak to us. And Lord, we pray that you'd use your mighty finger to graft these words into our heart, Lord, that they might be kept in a special place in our life that we might carry them forward, that, we, that out of our mouth these words might come, Lord. If you just graft them in our heart, 
that is that is the, the, the center of our belief structure, that is our passion, Lord, that we might just exhibit these things in our, in our walk with you. And so, Lord, we need your intervention. We need your Holy Spirit, and we need them now. And, Lord, we ask you to come amongst us and bless us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. There is very little argument about who the leader of the early church was. We're studying the book of Peter. And Peter, Petros, was the little rock, the little stone on which Christ built the church. And so it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit fell upon Peter. And Peter ministered so powerfully in a way that nobody has ever experienced before. He preached in a way no one's ever heard anyone preach before. And he preached under the complete and total control of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, boom! This thing that we call church came into existence. This is what we're doing here. And it all began with the very author of this epistle. It would not have come to us had he not surrendered to the ministry that Jesus called him to. And I told you that Jesus, after, after Peter had denied Jesus three times, Peter went back to his secular world. He said, you know, I can't follow Jesus anymore. He's dead. And so he gets back into a boat and he becomes a fisherman again. And as they fished all night long, they caught nothing. And somebody said, who's that sitting on that shore over there? Who is that by that fire over there? And it happened to be Jesus. Peter knew right away it was Jesus. So he dove into the water. And he swam to Jesus Christ on the shore. And he grasped him and he hugged him and he loved on him. And there was three things that Jesus asked Peter in that, on that encounter there on the beach. He said, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. And Peter says, I love you, I'll feed your sheep. And he says, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you, Lord, you know all things. He said, well, feed my sheep. Jesus asked him again a third time the exact same question, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. At this point, he's frustrated. And he says, Lord, you know I love you. I just swam across shark-infested waters to come embrace you, to tell you I'm sorry for denying you. And he says, then feed my sheep. And so Peter fully understands how important it is, the call of ministry, because Jesus, Jesus he, he grilled it into him. He says, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep. And so if you're called to the field of ministry, if you love the Lord, you will feed his sheep. That's your calling. And so being a good steward of someone else's uh, uh, possessions means that you'll take care of it better than you will take care of your own stuff. See, I tell you all, I told you all last week, I'll tell you this again. That if you were my sheep, if you belonged to me, then I'd probably not be as inclined to water and feed you as often as I should, like my very own at my house. Sometimes I don't get down there at the right time to give them their water, to give them their food, but I get down there. But since you belong to the Lord, then it is my great responsibility to treat you better than my own stuff. Because you are somebody... Who's, who cares for you in a way that is just undescribable. He loves you so much. And if I love that God, if I love that king, then I will care for his things better than I'll ever care for my own stuff. And so the call of ministry, Jesus said, feed my sheep. And so Peter says, I'll feed your sheep. I'll be a good steward of what you've asked me to do, and I'll take good care of your stock, your livestock. It's as, if it's important to you, God, it's important to me. And so the elders, Peter, he's talking to them, and he, and he writes this epistle, and he says, To the elders who are among you, I exhort. I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He, see, Peter could have easily said, Hey, I'm the guy who led thousands to Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. I'm the guy who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. I'm the guy who was there at his transfiguration. Whenever God went before the Father and all of a sudden his aura becomes so powerful and so bright that his countenance becomes something that was unbearable to look upon, Peter could have easily gave his credentials to why he is the chief minister of, of, of Jesus Christ and why he is the great under-shepherd of Jesus Christ, but he didn't want to let himself be confused with two simple facts. One, he is called to ministry just like me. No different than this man right here. I did, I've never led thousands to Jesus. I'll let you know that. And so, so Peter, secondly, he, he calls himself an elder who is like every other preacher. See, ministers are not special in any great aspect when it comes to the real calling of ministry. See, the real power, the real authority is in the name of Jesus Christ. And so preachers, they should never uh, uh, graffiti their church up with their names. They shouldn't say this church was founded by John Smith. 
because John Smith did not found the church. See, our foundation was in Jesus Christ. He's the one. And so God be the glory in all levels of ministry. So the priorities, number one, that we talked about last week, the priorities for Christian leadership are that they are the priorities of Jesus Christ. It should never be called my church or my flock or, or my plans or my message. These things are the words of Christ. This book is the words of Christ. This church belongs to him. This property belongs to him and I belong to him. I've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so Peter, he leads a great example. He says, I am a fellow elder just like you all. I'm no different. I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I'm also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. On the day of Jesus Christ's visitation, we will all be in the same boat. We'll all go before the same accountability seat. And we'll all give the same answer to God for the choices that we made in our life. And so Peter says that I am no great man. I am just a, a steward of Jesus Christ. And so we find ourselves in the second verse of our study. Shepherd the flock, verse 2. It says, shepherd the flock which is among you, serving as overseers. As an elder of the church, God has blessed us with this awesome privilege of shepherding his flock. What a great responsibility. Has anybody in your life ever charged you with the responsibility of looking, over their, looking after their car? Or looking after their house while they're out of town. Doesn't that make you feel special to know that they trust you so much that they would hand over their prized possession to you that they know that you would keep good charge over it? What a great feeling it is that somebody would trust you with their affairs. Do you not know when you were called to ministry that God has put a level of trust in you over his precious stock? It's so precious that he purchased this stock of believers in this room with his very own blood and he would, he would give me responsibility over your care. What an awesome responsibility, but what also is an intimidating responsibility. And have you ever worried about someone's stuff as you're trying to care for it? You're so afraid that something's going to happen to it. You're so afraid that that guy's car might get a scratch on it. You're so afraid that that guy's house might, somebody might break into it. They might, they might take something from him. And then all of a sudden, under your watch, something bad has happened. That's the same spirit ministry should be entered into. Not reverently, I mean not lightly, but reverently. You should understand that whenever you are taking responsibility of, of, of a group of people, of, of, of pairs and pairs of ears and eyes, that this responsibility is so important that, that, that God himself tells you to be good stewards of it, to care for it as though you are caring for God Almighty's very own personal account of stock. And so we should always remember that this stock does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And so I remember constantly when I come into this pulpit, I try to tell the Lord, I say, Lord, just let, me, just let me say what you'd have me to say. I don't want my own empty words to come up here, and I don't want my own empty thoughts to come up here that I might affect your lives in a way that would be displeasing to God and that ultimately would hurt you. And so this is important when studying the great work of ministry. And so I told you before, I have, I have a problem with churches who, who center themselves around the pastor. See, a good church that is built right is not built around the pastor. It's built around the people. See, I am a fellow elder with the elders in this room. And so it is us that make up the body of Christ. And any time that a church leans everything it has on the man in the pulpit is the moment that the church is most susceptible for destruction. And that's how churches fall apart under scandals. And that's how churches fall apart under, under uh, false doctrines in the pulpit is these pastors, they believe that their words are more valuable than the words of God. And they don't want to share with the people what, what God has to say, but they want to share with the people what they think should be said in the church. And so that's how the church foundation gets cracked. And that's how these churches slowly close and doors never open again is because there is too much leading from the pulpit and of a man instead of leading from the pulpit for Jesus Christ and sharing those difficult messages with the people here. And so I tell you this to, to, to help you to understand that whenever you come into a church, you don't join a church because of the person in the pulpit. It's because God is ministering to you. It's because you hear the word of God. It's because you were fed. See, you were the sheep of God. And if you are not being changed and you're not being challenged, you're not being pricked in your heart by the Holy Spirit, then you're not being fed or cared for by the master. And so don't put your stock 
in the minister of the church, but put your stock in Jesus Christ. Put, you, put your trust in Him in the same way that He puts His trust in the leaders of His church. And the best way to lose sight of whose church it is and whose flock it is that you're in the care of is to lose your relationship with God. And the best way to lose your relationship with God is to give up on your daily Bible reading and to get up, give up on your daily prayer life and to give up on all those things that are critical in keeping a real relationship with God. So to be a minister of the Word of God, you've got to take serious those things. How unequipped would I be for this pulpit if I forgot to pray before I come into it? Or if I forgot to pray throughout the week? How unfit for this pulpit would I be if I didn't study this Word of God? If I didn't fully understand it before I brought it to you, if I didn't share it for you, and if you're going to be a minister of God, if you hope to flee, feed uh, the people that are in this building, then you need to know the Word of God because this is the bread of life. And so we are all held to an account of our own private study time, our own private prayer time, and, our, and, and we are all to know the Lord and to stay close to Him so that we don't ever forget that we are caring for His stock, His people. And so secondly, we are serving not by constraint but willingly. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint but willingly. What does constraint mean? It means serving by compulsion. Let me give you an example of this. See, at my job, I serve by constraint. I have to work. <laughs> I have to. I've got to feed my family. A lot of us serve by constraint. We didn't even know it. Those of us who have jobs, we go to our job, we perform a duty because that duty is tied to some kind of monetary uh, uh, return which helps us to take care of our home. So we serve in our jobs by constraint. But Peter tells us here that you are not to serve in ministry by constraint. Don't feel like the church has to have you in that position and if you're not in that position, then that job's not going to get done because that is not the attitude in which God wants you to, to serve him. He wants you to serve willingly. And so I can explain it to you like this. This is the best possible representation of constraint. I'd like to use my daughter Morgan sitting right here on the, on the third pew. See, if I ask her to take out the garbage, she will serve me by constraint. Because she knows I'll constrain her if she don't take out the garbage. And so her attitude will reflect that. I get it all the time. I get it, ugh, okay, Dad. And she takes the garbage out and she drags the bag all the way out the door. And then I got to tell her, hey, put a liner back in it. And that, that's what constraint is, serving by constraint. But if I told her, hey, you got, a you got a volleyball game today, boy, she would jump up. She would be happy. She'd be eager. She couldn't wait to get on the field. She couldn't wait to serve her team. She couldn't wait to serve the ball. And she'd be so happy. Her attitude would reflect that. And so Peter is saying, is if you're going to be a minister and you choose to shepherd the flock, which is among you, and you want to serve as an overseer, then don't do it by constraint. Don't feel like you have to do it. Because you don't have to do it. You can choose not to. And really, in your spirit and in your attitude, you have already chosen not to. But God says that this should be willful. You should be willing to do it. And when my father got sick, I didn't serve him by constraint. I say it all the time. I say, there's nobody else to care for my dad when he was ill. I say that. But I'll tell you this. I served my father in the last days of his life because I loved him. And I was willing to do it. And I was grateful there was nobody else willing to do it. Because I got to receive all the blessings from that time with my dad. And it was not easy. My dad was very ill, he was very sick, and the job was very hard, and, it was not, and he was not an easy man to deal with whenever he was healthy, not to mention whenever he started getting unhealthy. And so I served him willingly, because I loved him. And it was obvious to my father that I served him willingly. And I tell you this, when you serve God, your father, willingly, it is obvious to him and everyone else that you love serving the Lord. And it's about a testimony that people are looking and so we don't want to be the type of Christians who have that take out the garbage attitude, right? You don't want to be that Christian who feels like you have to cut the grass, like you have to lead the music, like I have to climb in this pulpit and I have to share with you the word of God. That is not the idea of ministry. See, Jesus didn't come by constraint. He come willingly to serve us, 
willingly. He wanted to. He wanted to provide a way. And our spirit should be the same as him. We should have the same mind as Christ when we are going through sufferings as well as when we are ministering the great work of the Lord Almighty. And so we should have a, a, an eagerness to get out there, to get in the game. Do you not know how, how rewarding and filling it was when we had this, this young man, Mr. Chavez, come up here and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ last Sunday? Do you know what that felt like for me? To believe that God Almighty would minister through me a message that I couldn't explain to that young man on my own. I'm telling you, I don't speak young man very well these days. I'm getting too old. I'm out of the cool crowd. But somehow I thought I was preaching to adults in here. I thought I was articulating some kind of philosophical movement and I was blowing you all's minds and then a child comes up and he says, that was so good, I understood it. Blew my mind. I was like, wow, this kid, he's so intelligent. He figured it out. <laughs> and I was so proud. And so that's what a willingness to serve God will produce is that kind of joy. And you're not bummed by the excitement of others, but you're encouraged by it. And so you produce this, this zeal and this passion and this love that is intoxicating. And whenever you serve the Lord willingly, the people around you can't help but want to serve willingly with you. Because you seem happy. And they want to do what's happy. But when, you ever work with somebody who just hates to be at work? That spends the entire day complaining about their job. Does it make your job easier to do next to that? It's the same formula for ministry. If you're not excited to serve God in this house, then get out of the way. Because you're going to bring down the Spirit of God. You're going to quench the Holy Spirit and let someone come in who has a real passion, a real zeal, and who is willing to serve God because they love Him and they want this intoxicating feeling to overcome them and spill out of them. And they want their little light to so shine that, that it just can't help but ignite a passion in this church that everyone would get excited for the Lord. And then all of a sudden we become a church full of joy. Wouldn't that be amazing? Who would think that the church was designed behind such easy to understand principles? And so we don't need to, 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 to suffer when God calls us to ministry. It's not a suffering affair. There are rewards here to this job. Now I'll tell you, whenever I have to come to the church and I have to cut the grass, I'm not particularly excited thinking about it, but when I get done, I'm greatly rewarded. If you've ever been to the gym, if you've ever exercised in your life, you ever worked out, it's never no fun going to the gym. It's never no fun putting yourself through the torture of it. But when you're done, the reward is so great and so incredible, you can't wait till the next time you go and do it again. And so that should be the attitude of a Christian. So you come into this place seeking a reward from God because you're willing to come into this place and to do this great work. Secondly, we serve not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Let's look at verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for monetary gain, but eagerly. See, the purpose of serving the Lord is not for such perishable item as money. I'm telling you right now, if anybody has ever joined the field of ministry to get rich, they have been fooled. <laughs> There's not a lot of money in this job. And that's okay. That's okay, because we're not in it for the money. And if you're in it for the money, then you should quit. Because I'm reminded of somebody who was in it for the money. Maybe you've heard of them. You ever heard of Judas Iscariot? See, Judas was in it for the money. And when Jesus called Judas to be one of his disciples, eventually called him to be his apostle, the whole time Judas, he, he never doubted that Jesus was going to be king. He just didn't know that he was going to be king of the universe. He thought he was going to be king of the world. So Judas said, I'm going to follow Jesus because you know what? If, if Jesus becomes king of this world, then guess what? I'll be his treasurer. And so we learn from the text that Judas carried the purse. He carried all the money for all the apostles, all the offerings, all the tithes. Judas carried them around. And, so, and you're like, well, well then um, how come Jesus didn't see it? Jesus did see it. Jesus gave them equal opportunity to salvation and he let them come in and he let them serve. And sometimes we wonder why God lets people in the church who would take, take the church for monetary gain. And we have this example for that reason. And so Judas, he followed Jesus every day. And surely on, the, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus come riding in on that donkey and they, and they threw down the palms and all these people were worshiping Jesus as though he was king of this world, as though he's going to be the new king that was brought up for the, for the Jewish people. You had to picture Judas going, yes, this is my day. 
Yes, this is my day. He's going to be king of this world and he's going to announce me one of his faithful and I'm going to have a great job and I'm going to be able to steal from a much bigger purse than the one which is the offering that we're taking up now. And scripture tells us that Judas, he robbed the offering constantly. He just took from the offering what he wanted for his own gain. And that's why he served God is because the money was good and the prestige was good. And the honor that come from being one of Jesus' inner circle was good. And he liked it for all the wrong reasons. And then when he finally figured it out that Jesus was going to go, that he was going to die, and he was going to be king of kings, but not here on this perishable rock that we call earth, but he's going to be king of a better place, one worthy of him, then Judas got disgusted. And so what did he do? He sold the ministry for 30 pieces of silver. And he sold his savior for 30 pieces of silver. It's all about the money to Judas. And there are people like that in the church who witness Sunday after Sunday the miracles of God and the presence of God and the position of God in the church and what he does, and, and they still turn their backs on him. And I'm also reminded of another man. Miss Kathy's not here today, but her husband. One thing he told me from very young in my mentorship, he, I ne he said, I never took a job and never at any church as pastor, I've never taken a job and knew what I was getting paid up front. He says, always after I preached my first sermon before I ever knew what I was going to get paid. And that's what ministry is supposed to be like. The money is inconsequential. If God calls you to a job, it's not because you're going to get paid doing it. It's because he wants you to do it. Let him worry about those things later. And so you shouldn't be in it for any kind of monetary gain, but there's also another type of gain that can be had from the ministry and that is one of personal recognition it's very addictive for many people to be the center of attention some people are attention seekers some people are power hungry some people seek the great opportunity to tell people how to live their lives it makes them feel like they're somebody special that they're somebody uh, uh, who is important but but the scripture tells us that we're to be Christ's under shepherd that it is not for our recognition, but it is so that the master would get recognition. And so that God would get the glory. And so that God would, be, would, would get all the attention of it. Attending to the flock that belongs to God is a job that requires focus and concentration. Because the enemy will fool you and make you feel more special than you are. There's nothing special about us except for the fact that Jesus has decided to work himself through us. And, and in us. And the only thing good about us is the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The only thing good in us is what Jesus has put in there. But us ourselves, we are built to, to fail this system as human beings. How many churches fail every day behind men that just do not carry the word of God reverently and who do not feed the sheep that meal which they desire? Their soul desires. They, they leave the church and their ears are not satisfied and their hearts are not repaired and their lives are still a mess. And I have a friend, I've said this before, but he goes to a church and they, and they have these really suspicious belief systems within that church. And, and one of which is, is that they have the ability to, to speak in tongues. And this man, he loves the Lord and he never had that ability that he could never speak in this in this angelic language as they call it and so he felt inadequate so much that it drove him to leave the church and to this day he has no relationship with Jesus Christ there are liars that come into the pulpit and they say these things because they have selfish gain in their selfish hearts and they lead the people astray and I'm here to tell you that I don't want to be that guy and if you're going to join the ministry because you want attention on you and you want your name on a sign or you want your name on a program then you should just run from the job and you should never ever partake in that responsibility because you are not being called for it if that's your ambition and that's your drive so the next word in our scripture is eager instead of ministering out of compulsion or constraint or for our own personal gain whether it's financially or whether it's to boost our ego or to give her give us a bigger head we're to minister eagerly can you see the difference in a church worker one who is eager to get here i come in this morning let me tell you something. I come in this morning and I open the doors of that fellowship hall over there and somebody had already put stuff on the table for Children's Church. That is an eager person to minister the Word of God. They're already up here preparing. You don't have to wait till the day of church to prepare something for the kids. 
You don't have to wait until the day before, two days before. But when you are eager to serve the Lord and you're eager to minister for the Lord, preparation is all week long. There's no time constraint that, that is acceptable. You want to work on the Lord's business. You want to get and dive into the Lord's business. You want to serve Him genuinely. And you're happy to perform the duties. And it's not for your own personal office. And it's not for your own personal gain. And it's not for your own personal attention. And it's not because God said that, oh, uh, I need you to do this for me. It's because you're eager and you're willing to be a part of God's work. God's work's going to go forward with or without you. That's the bottom line. We're not special. God can still move this church into the future with or without us because he's God. But it is our job to get partnered with him eagerly, willingly, not by constraint. We have way too many ministers and elders who have a carry out the garbage attitude is the bottom line. There's too many people who feel like that they just... They just got to do it because they've been told to do it. And then really, at the end of the day, that their heart is not right with God. They don't love God so much that they can't wait to serve him. That they can't wait to be a part of his great and mighty work. Then they go where the Father wants them to go, and they do what God wants them to do. The Father asks them to do because they know that the byproduct of that is, is, is favor and blessing. And lastly, we serve not as being lords over those entrusted to you. I like this translation. God has not called us to be dictators of the flock. See, in this early church, there was a system of religion in place that was ran by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were called the holier than thou's. See, you did what they said because they had a special uh, link with God that you'll never have, that you're incapable of getting. And so they ruled over their people. Also in that society, there was a rule, rule of the Romans. It ruled over people. And so he says that you serve not as being lords over those entrusted to you. And Peter tells us in the very opening parts of this, of, of, of this fifth chapter of this epistle, he says, who I am a fellow elder, saying I'm not lording over you guys. I'm giving you valuable advice that the Lord had given to me, and not as your master, and not as your Lord. And I tell you from the pulpit, I'm not telling you these things as your Lord or as your master. I'm telling you what God qualified me for the job of ministry to have before I ever come in here. It's the same calling we all have. That we treat his business as serious as he treats it. I don't want to lord over anybody. Because the moment that I take that responsibility is the moment that I set this entire church up for failure and all the people in it. Unfortunately, this is a model that is witnessed all too often in the church today. There is some form of government in the churches today that believe the pastor is the, uh, is the dictator over it. And, and he lords over every aspect of the church. He wants to control the money. He wants to control the finances. He wants to control the music. He wants to control the outreach. He wants to control the people. And any act of defiance in any of these directions is an act of treason, punishable by expulsion from the church. That's unacceptable. Peter, he espouses this teaching. He shouts it down and he is sharing from his own experience with Jesus. See, it was Jesus who had taught Peter and the disciples this important truth about Christian leadership. He said it this way, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. And I like this part. This is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, right? We call him Master. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Ministry is service. If Jesus could leave his place on high where he was served constantly by angels and every being in that heavenly place served him and exalted him and lifted him up and, and showered him with favors and blessings, rightfully so. If Jesus can come down to this place and wash some disciples' feet, surely we can minister in the same kind of heart and the same kind of spirit of Jesus. He practiced a servant style of leadership. And it is that servant style of leadership which he has entrusted to us, an effective shepherd. He's always willing to give his life for the sheep. And an effective pastor gives his life for the flock of God. And so what I hope to do is I don't hope to discourage any of you from the ministry. 
What I desire more than anything is for someone to take up the call of ministry. That this fire might spread. I hope there's somebody in here willing to serve God. Not because of compulsion, but because you're eager and you're willing and you love the Lord. I, I hope there's somebody here willing to go through a discipleship program, a mentorship. That the word of God might spread beyond these walls and that there might be another church that, is, that, that needs a pastor. That somebody might hear the call and might get there. And if I could just help people to become ministers in the church, then I could just do my part as a minister of God. Yeah, I want to reach people. I want people to find Jesus. I want people to get saved. But after that. But after that, I want people to become ministers and help get this word out here. And I don't want to discourage anyone from this, but I want you to know that this is a, a holy calling. It's a massive responsibility and it's intimidating. But you just have to remember this one thing. It's not about you. It's about God. And no level of preparation in your life, if you're eager and you're willing, the Holy Spirit will supply to you in that moment the things that you need to say and that attitude in which you need to have. And that joy when you need it, and that strength, and that boldness, and everything is about God, and everything is about Christ, and your ministry, then the Holy Spirit will not fail you when you need Him to do an adequate job. And so as I close, I want to ask that our music leaders would prepare a song of invitation. I want you to think about this four-step model of a minister minister first of all minister is to shepherd the flock of God they've been entrusted to your care secondly you need to serve not by constraint but willingly third of all you need to serve not for monetary gain but eagerly and fourth of all to serve not by being lord over those entrusted to you but by being an example to the flock I don't want to be your leader indeed only I want to show you what it's like to serve God. I'd hope you'd follow me by the way I live my life and not necessarily by the words that I say because that might make me a hypocrite. And the pulpit is no place for a hypocrite. Hypocrites are liars. And it's always selfish gain and selfish ambitions. And it's always driven by, by a selfish uh, motivation. But ministers are not called to that, to be hypocrites. Our job is to serve the master, to be good stewards over whatever he has given us. And I want you to know, each and every person in here, they have a special gift. He's trusted you to do what is right with that. To be a good steward with that superhuman ability that He's put inside you that might show somebody a pathway to Jesus Christ, that might show them an opportunity of salvation. And why did He do such a thing? Scripture goes on to tell us in verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. In other words, we are accountable to the chief shepherd for the stewardship of how we care for his flock. And in return, he'll reward those under shepherds who have been faithful in their ministry with something imperishable. Something far above monetary gain and something far above personal recognition. He will place a crown upon your head as a reward that will endure forever. It does not fade away. And he'll put his glory upon your head because he'll be so proud of you. Say, well done, my good and faithful servant question for you how long will you ignore the ministry that Christ has called you to you know in your hearts what God's asked you to do with your life you know I don't know but you do God's asked you to do something special with this life not live it for yourself let's live it for each other let's go to the Lord in prayer father we thank you for this time in your word and Lord if there's a pastor in here today if there's a children's church worker, if there's somebody just willing to serve and they're not even sure where, Lord, but they're willing and they're eager, God, I pray that you just pour a special blessing upon their head and their body. And Lord, that you might anoint them and equip them for this ministry and this calling, Lord. And I pray that you just put favor on them. And if there's anybody in here who don't know Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that this message spoke to their heart. I pray, Lord, that they are challenged. Lord, I pray your blessing over this invitation, and I ask for it in Jesus' name.